Good morning. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house and the Lord's day. Uh, if you would look on the back of your bulletin, you will find a number of diff- different announcements about things that are happening this week and in coming weeks. And it's always good to be encouraged to consult that. Let me just kind of remind you about this week especially. Uh, Wednesday night will not be our regular Wednesday night activities. Instead, we have our annual fall festival for children uh, that will be happening down in the fellowship hall. Uh, if you would remember, though, to sign up for that just as you would for a regular uh, Wednesday night meal, and if you plan on bringing friends or family to that, I uh, would encourage you to, to go ahead and sign up for them as well. Uh, make sure you do that by, by noon on Tuesday in order to give plenty of time to, to provide Michelle with all she needs for, uh, for preparing that meal. Uh, just remember, we'll have all the kind of the standard, the, the fair food, carnival food there uh, that's available, along with games for the kids, uh, pumpkin carving judging uh, and lego creation judging as well those those things never get old if you're a kid so you know parents you might have seen this a number of times but the kids the few times we've tried to drop that and just the the outcry uh, that goes out so uh, so remember to do preparations for that and then we'll see you wednesday night uh, 5 45 if, if you want there are little flyers available at the the visitors uh, information desk you can pick up some of those and and pass those on for more information I uh, also want to point out to parents of senior high students and senior high students is we have an opportunity for a fall retreat. Our regular fall conference in Ridge Haven has been canceled this year, but we're working on a fall retreat ourselves. And that would happen the weekend, November 13th through the 15th. Uh, I need to get sign-up information today so we can register at an alternate site. Uh, and so talk to me in Sunday school class. We'll meet just a little bit earlier. So senior high students, hustle down there. Let me know today if you want to be a part uh, of that retreat. Uh, and then I think that an email went out, and I hope that you've seen it already, about the Voice of the Martyrs uh, action packs um, that we're working to assemble. And what these are, if you didn't get this, this is, this is a great way for us to be involved in supporting the persecuted church. Uh, these action packs are a- actually uh, small packs of supplies of just very basic kind of fundamental needs that you can pack into a, to a small box. Uh, that are provided to families that are fleeing their homes because of persecution. And this is a wa- worldwide phenomenon. Uh, various countries where believers are under persecution are literally fleeing from their homes. Uh, these are just a small resource that you can give to someone just to, to, to provide a little bit of comfort and ease. And so we've signed up to uh, provide 50 of these. And so the way that you'll be a part of this is that you will and go on, respond to the Evite that went out, uh, let me know I can provide this number of items. And we'll work to get all those items together. And then I believe it's on November 21st from 10 to noon, there'll be a packing party that takes place where we'll take all the supplies that people bring in and gather for that. We will assemble those and get ready to ship those off. So again, a great way to to love and to serve the persecuted church uh, worldwide. A couple of other reminders, the College Plus Sunday School class is still going on. If you missed the announcement, then you can find information in the bulletin. Uh, And also to remind you about Daylight Savings Time is next week. And so this is the hour where you get to take a little extra time to relax and and set your clocks back and so that um, that you'll have that extra hour before you come in. And also just remember that if you are late next Sunday, there's a double heaping of shame uh, whenever you show up. And so just, you know, if they couldn't get it together in Fall Daylight Savings, then um, that, that's a judgment of you. So just remember that um, when you plan ahead. And lastly, if you're a visitor uh, with us this morning, we try not to shame you too much. Um, we, we'd love it if you would do a few things for us to get to know us better, not just the, the, the harsh side of us, but the, the happy side. Uh, grab that blue visitor information card in front of you in the pew. Fill that out. Drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. Uh, that helps us to get to know you. Come join us for fellowship down the fellowship hall. We have refreshments available down there. And then stick around for an excellent Sunday school class with Pastor Dodds uh, that's uh, just outside um, the Fellowship Hall in room 134. Uh, Pastor Dodds will be teaching this morning the visitor's class on the role of biblical law in the life of a believer. So it's a great class to listen to contemplate what the Bible teaches, what what Christ requires of those who are his disciples. And so I encourage you to come uh, and be a part of that. And again, stop by the visitor's table. Um, the, The men's work week is upcoming. Um, and if you haven't signed up for that, you're planning to be a part of that, do that. There's, there's a flyer there as well for those men uh, that are working on that, that work week. And so uh, see Pastor Dodds for that as well. Now as we begin to think about uh, coming to the worship of God, I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, what he wrote to the church in Thessalonica when he was encouraging them as to his nearness to them, to them as a church and his concern for them in prayer. 
And this is what he said. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, your being chosen by God. And then he says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. You're here this morning by the grace of God to us in Christ. The power of God has been at work in you to draw you here. It's not an accident. Praise the Lord this morning that you weren't left to yourselves, that you weren't having to make wise decisions that you could never have made on your own, but instead he has drawn you here to be a part of his praise because he's drawn you to the Lord Jesus Christ. So prepare yourself now to rejoice in Christ as you worship. Here now as God calls you into his worship by the words of Lamentations chapter 3. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's respond to God's call for us to worship him by taking our Psalter hymnals and standing and singing hymn number 230, Holy, 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 hymn 230.
To remain standing, would you now take your bulletins and together we'll confess our faith using the form that's printed there. It comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 10, speaking of our being effectually or effectively called to salvation in Christ. So concerning these things, Christians, I ask you, what do you believe? All of those whom God If you remain standing, will you take your Bibles and turn with me for our Old Testament reading to Psalm 96. You also want to note the response to the reading of God's Word, which is printed in your bulletin. Here now God's Word from the Old Testament, Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word Amen. Please be seated. This morning, it's our privilege to welcome into our congregation several new communing members. And so at this time, let me ask the Carters and the Georges and the Limleys and Lucas Hoyle, if you will come and stand down front with me. Ask you to stand over here. All right, if you don't know who you're looking at, uh, to my immediate left, your, wait, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's sort of to your left, too. That threw me off. Uh, Steve, uh, who's wearing a very respectable bow tie. 
uh, and Mary Ray Carter. Uh, you also have David and Sarah George and their three covenant children, uh, Benton, who's furthest from me, and Ruth and Wyatt. Uh, you have Lucas Hoyle, and then you have Dan and Phyllis Limley on the end. Uh, and what's, what's kind of neat about these people is you have a spectrum of different stories, but in some ways you're, you're looking at people who have been family already. Uh, Steve and Mary Ray, they come from a PCA town, uh, a PCA church just, just across town. Uh, and so they're, in some sense, family already. David and, and Sarah George and, and their group represent the multi-generations of the George clan here at Woodruff Road Presbyterian Church. And, um, and, and they've been with us many times over the year. Uh, Lucas Hoyle uh, down there is, is the son of uh, ruling elder uh, Ron Hoyle. And so he's, he spent time in this church from early on in his life. Maybe, do you remember when you were here before? No, it's beyond his memory, but we remember him. Um, and, uh, and then Dan and Phyllis Lemley have served this church very faithfully in years past as well. Dan was formerly a ruling elder, and uh, Phyllis, he and Phyllis did just amazing things as part of our, our missions committee. And so you're looking at people that are, are, are not really strangers to you uh, in many ways. And so, so we're happy to receive family, but to receive them in closer uh, as communing members. But also, they're more than just a picture of family. They're, they're a picture of fulfilled prophecy. Uh, in, the, in the reading and the preaching of the word this morning from John chapter 12, you're, you're going to hear Jesus say the, those, those very memorable words. He says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. You are looking at fulfilled prophecy when you see these people who are not smart enough to earn their way into this church. They didn't pass any kind of particular test on some kind of written test and examination that would allow them to be here. And they would have never actually come to that choice were it not for the fact that Christ himself was lifted up and he drew them to himself. He saved them by his grace the same way that all those here who are communing members who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior were drawn to him. And so it's a testimony to the power of God and the work of the Spirit over the ages and the fact the Spirit is still working to draw people to himself. And so we rejoice to see them this morning to see Christ's word fulfilled. So let me ask you again to testify to what the Lord has done for you by asking you those questions that you've heard uh, before many times. Uh, but I want you to... to, to Hear them again and give your answer by saying I do to each of those questions so that your brothers and sisters here in the church can hear you as well. First off, do you acknowledge yourself to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope save in his sovereign mercy? I do. do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And finally, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Very good. Let's, let's pray and give God thanks. Our Lord, again, we recognize that Humbly, we come before you, being those who needed your work in us to be drawn here, to rescue us from ourselves, from our sins, from your wrath, and to make us into family. We thank you for these this morning that you brought here and made a part of this family. Pray, Father, that in days to come, we will serve one another well in our worship of you and in building one another up. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. When Solomon was despairing over the fleeting value of living for this world, he came to this wise observation, maybe in the wisest of ways, but from experience he learned this. He says in, in Ecclesiastes 5, he says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with abundance. Thinking carnally and looking hard at, 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 at an amazing amount of abundance, he came to this conclusion that it's, it doesn't satisfy. And it teaches us, it reminds us that there's a greater spiritual truth, that the greater rewards are in sacrificial giving to the Lord. We're not meant to be satisfied by money, we're meant to be satisfied with the Lord himself. And so even now when we give tithes and offerings, we are seeking that kingdom which is outside of ourselves. We're seeking that which does give life and which will satisfy in the Lord. So let's do so now. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we love you. We pray that in this moment our service before you, that it would be evident that we do love you. When we give to you, 
when we seek the glory of Christ, when we seek to honor your name. And pray, Father, you would reward that seeking of you with joy and with contentment. And pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Join with me as we pray. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, O God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Father, all things come from you. Our days on earth or as a shadow, and without hope, except by your sovereign grace in our life. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive blessing and honor and glory and power, for you have created all things for your pleasure. You uphold all things by the word of your power, and by your will all things exist. You are righteous in all your ways and holy in all your works. Your name, O Lord, endures forever throughout all generations. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have sinned and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended your holy laws. We have left undone those things which you ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is nothing good in us. O Lord, have mercy on us, miserable offenders. 
Spare those, O God, who confess their faults and restore to them the joy of your salvation according to your promises declared to men in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Father, we have so much to thank you for this morning. We are thankful for your salvation, for your faithfulness, your love, your mercy, and the means of grace that we enjoy. We thank you for our families, our friends, our church, our pastors, the food on our tables, and your protection from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the freedom to worship you. We thank you for your revealed will in your word and for giving us minds and hearts to understand and apply it in our everyday lives. We now pray for the success of the gospel all over the world. We pray for the salvation of those whom you have ordained to eternal life and for the growth of the true church and for the breaking of power of all the enemies of the church. We pray for our country and its leaders. Give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, and a spirit of knowledge and a holy conviction of the fear of the Lord. We especially pray for the upcoming elections. May your kingdom come and your perfect will be done through this process. We ask for healing and comfort for those among us who are undergoing pain and suffering every day. May their afflictions fail in comparison to the joys that await them in eternity. Use this time to sanctify them by your word and spirit. Now, Father, we pray that you would quiet our souls Eliminate any distractions and direct our attention to the preaching of your holy word. Anoint our pastor to preach Christ in him only. May your name be glorified and may our hearts be transformed by the work of your spirit in our lives. We offer this prayer to you, Heavenly Father, through Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 27 through 33. Would you stand again to give honor to the reading of God's word from the New Testament? John, chapter 12, verses 27 through 33. Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am Lifted up from the earth will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. This is the word of the Lord. As you remain standing, take your Psalter hymnals and turn to hymn number 243, How Firm a Foundation. Let's remain standing to sing How Firm a Foundation, hymn 243.
as we've studied the Gospel of John and we've watched our Lord's public ministry proceed. All through his three-year ministry, we have watched Jesus pray. We've been reminded at various points of the frequency of his prayer life. And we've seen Jesus doing what he commanded others to do when he gives the model prayer, the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer. And we see him engaging in closet prayer, secret prayer, going off to a mountaintop or the wilderness to pray. He chooses private places to model for us a right practice. And don't you and I have more business in the closet than he? He had no sins to confess, no need to ask forgiveness, no need to ask for any sanctifying graces, but he did this because he loved communion with his father. Martin Luther understood this. He wrote to an inquiring friend who asked him about prayer. Luther said, I usually pray two hours a day, but on my busy days, I must get up early and pray three because there is so much to seek my father for. It is the mark of the Christ imitating life to pray. It is the mark of a faithful church that at the core of its ministry is a vital emphasis on corporate prayer. No effective ministry can be maintained without regular, biblically saturated prayer. In fact, let me just tell you very briefly why there's so much religious activity and yet so little cultural transformation, so few conversions, so little progress in sanctification. The reply is simple. Prayerlessness. We have not because we ask not. The old maxim is still true. Much prayer, much power. No prayer, no power. Today, in our ongoing exposition of John's gospel, and I hope you have your Bible open to John 12, we're going to once again hear Jesus praying in the briefest of prayers. In fact, you may have a moment ago when Pastor Anderson read the text even not noticed because it's so brief that our Lord prayed. But this time something highly unusual happens when he prays in John 12. The recipient of that prayer, the Father, answers immediately and audibly when Jesus prays. Now, let me remind you how we got here. In John 12, we are now in the final week of our Lord's life. And after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, a group of Gentiles, we are told in verses 23 through 26, have come to Jerusalem to worship and celebrate Passover and they see our Lord Jesus cleansing the temple. They're in the court of the Gentiles, and they see him driving out the money changers. And they are so impressed, so drawn to him that they come and seek an audience with Jesus. These are Gentile proselytes. And Jesus speaks to them, if you look at verse 23 through 26, about, first of all, the fact that the hour has come. He tells them that. It's now Passion Week. It's a few days before the cross. And then he makes this parabolic statement in verse 24 about a grain of wheat dying, and only then can it produce much grain, meaning that unless he dies, no one will be saved. And if he does die, many will have life from his death. And then in verse 25 through 26, look carefully at this, because this prompts in our Lord's own mind the discussion that we'll see today. In verse 25 and 26, Jesus speaks of, the necessity of losing one's life. And for our sakes, that means following hard after Christ. So I want you to open your Bible, if you haven't already, to John 12. Keep it open, because we're going to engage in a deep dive, some careful study of the words of Jesus and his Father as we draw nearer to the cross and to Good Friday. Let's seek the Lord's help now. Our Father, since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, Make us hunger for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Look carefully at John 12, verse 27. Jesus has just been talking about his own death in verse 24. Notice what he says. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat 
falls into the grain ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He's referring to his own death just a few days away now. And so this provides the platform for his words in verse 27. Look there carefully. Jesus states that his soul is troubled. The Greek word of, that's translated in your and my translation as troubled has the connotation of horrified. Whenever you and I are troubled, it's usually because of our own sins and fears, but not Jesus. His troubled soul was for our sins. Now, when you hear these words in verse 27 and 28, look at them carefully, and you could almost be excused for being confused and say, haven't I heard these words before? Am I misplacing them? Because what you see there in verse 27 and 28 is almost an exact parallel to the words that Jesus will pray in the Garden of Gethsemane late on Thursday night, just before his arrest. For example, he says these words, now my soul is troubled. We'll hear him in the Garden of Gethsemane pray, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Here he prays, Father, save me from this hour. There we'll hear him at Gethsemane pray, Father, if it's possible, let this cut pass for me. And so what we realize is these thoughts are, are pervading in on his mind and heart, and they stay with him for the next few days. And part of the reason why Jesus is so troubled, his soul is troubled, is he's facing an overwhelming responsibility. Think of what had been entrusted to him. And now he's just a few hours away from it. It has been entrusted to him to perfectly represent billions and billions of sinners, a great number that no man can number, but to be their perfect spotless representative. It's been entrusted to him at the same time to represent God in his holiness and justice. It's been entrusted to him to go into the darkness on the cross to descend into hell, to pay an infinite eternal penalty for the sins of all his people compressed into six hours. Some have thought when they see these words here in verse 27 and 28 that Jesus is shrinking back from the cross because he's just contemplating the incredible physical suffering that awaited him there. And Jesus was completely knowledgeable of what would happen to him in just a couple of days, three days, physically. He knew what was coming. Every torn muscle, every thorn gashing his forehead, every gasp for breath over those six hours, all the swarms of flies buzzing around his head that he would be powerless to stop. But that's not what was troubling him. Look at verse 27 and 28. When he says, now my soul is troubled. What was troubling him was this. Not the issue of physical pain. But it was that he would take on himself and receive the wrath of God the Father. Poured out on him for the sins of others as a substitute. That is what threw his righteous soul into turmoil, that close association with sin. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Paul writes again in Galatians 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That's what troubled Christ so deeply, was this, this tight association with sin that was now just a few days away. Jesus was beginning already to feel the awful weight of man's sin pressing down on him. The guilt, the imputed guilt of billions of sinners put to his account, which made him groan and say these words in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. And so his holy human nature shrinks back from the hour. He wouldn't have been a normal human being with a normal human nature if he had not recoiled from the cross. But in the midst of this, look at verse 28. Jesus prays this, this very brief prayer. Look at what he says. As he speaks of his troubled soul, 
he cries out, Father, glorify your name. This is the heartbeat of every true believer. If you're in Christ today, you know something about this, of praying, even in difficult situations, for God to glorify his name. Notice what Christ's petition is. Look in verse 28. Not, Father, deliver me from pain, but, Father, glorify your name. What is man's chief end? Our children, if they're involved, if your children are involved in our catechism ministry on Wednesday night, it's, it might be the absolute best thing we do. And we are teaching our children rich, sturdy doctrine. And they all start with that glorious question number one. We have four and five-year-olds who know this deep doctrinal truth. What is man's chief end? And we have little kids who barely know which way to go up and down the hall who can respond with, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You remember when Paul was in a Roman prison, he wrote to the Philippian church, he had planted and said that his great desire, not that he'd be sprung from prison, but was that Christ be glorified in my body, whether by my life or my death. Notice, this is what Jesus, he keeps his eye on the ball. Look at verse 28 when he prays. His petition, his solo petition is, Father, glorify your name. That's, that's why we, we know it's safe territory to say, our chief end, our, our first goal in all things is always to say, how can God receive glory? Because even in this moment, as Jesus is facing the cross, what does he pray? Father, somehow out of this, out of this hideous cross, bring glory to yourself. And then comes an astounding moment. The Father answers. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, what you and I are made privy to is an inter-Trinitarian conversation. The Son asks, the Father answers. Now, the crowds are immediately confused over what they've heard. Look at verse 29. Everyone is, is thrown into a confusion. What, what did we just hear? Some think, we are told in verse 29, they've heard thunder. These are the anti-supernaturalists who have some natural explanation for any supernatural event. Do you know what's said of them? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man... He doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. But they're close, because oftentimes in the Old Testament, for example, when God speaks from heaven, it's described as thunder. For example, in Exodus 19, before God spoke from atop Mount Sinai to give the law, the people thought that it was thunder. Or in Psalm 18, we read, The Lord thundered from heaven when the Most High uttered his voice. Or in Job 40, when Job is, is being rebuked by God for questioning God. The Lord responds to him and says, Have you an arm like God, or can you thunder with a voice like his? And so notice when the Father speaks, look at verse 29. There are some people say, well, I didn't know the weather forecast called for a thunderstorm today. That's the best they can do. There are others, look at verse 29, they're a little more supernaturally inclined. They think it's an angel speaking to Jesus. They hear this otherworldly voice. And then the, Jesus clarifies for everyone, look carefully at verse 30. He clarifies why the Father spoke in an audible manner in verse 30. It was for the sake of these bystanders to assure them that he was the son of the father, the heaven sent Messiah. Now I want you to think about the father speaking during the public ministry of Jesus before. It's not like it happened every day, but in a three year public ministry, the father spoke at the anointing of Jesus. You remember when Christ began his public ministry and he was anointed for priesthood? And in Mark 1, verse 11, we hear the father saying out of heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then once again, a second time at the transfiguration of Jesus, what does the father say? This is my beloved son, hear him. And now, just before the crucifixion, for a third occasion, 
The father speaks in answer to the son's petition. Now look at his answer. Look carefully at verse 28. Look at what the father's answer is. Jesus has prayed. Here's the petition. So let's match up the petition with the answer. Jesus has prayed, Father, glorify yourself. The father states what he's done in the past in verse 28. That I have glorified my name through the incarnation and the earthly ministry of Jesus. And he intends to do it again, he says, in the death of Jesus. By the way, what you see here is one of a thousand biblical proofs of Trinitarianism. You have here the clear distinction of the persons of the Godhead. Person number one, that would be the son, is speaking to person number two, that would be the father. This is why we're not Unitarians. The next time somebody says, why do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? You can take them here. This is one of many texts that teach this. But then notice what Jesus says. He teaches us much about what will happen in the crucifixion. What will be the effect of it? Look at verse 31. Jesus states, begins to state what is happening right now. We are at the week. We are at Holy Week, Passion Week, when Jesus will take on himself the sins of the world. Look what he says about it. It's not an unexplained phenomena. Jesus says the cross will be the judgment of the world in verse 31. In what way would the cross constitute the judgment of the world? Well, the cross would expose the ugly depths of human depravity and the extent to which mankind is in the grip of the evil one, that men would plot and rush and scheme to kill God the Son. <coughs> it would also be the judgment of the world in that it would reveal the horrors of hell as, be, as in front of their very eyes. Grasp this with me for a moment. In front of the eyes of men, they would watch a man sink into hell. They would watch a man descend into judgment as Jesus endures the agony and the awfulness of being cut off from the Father. And his sufferings there serve as a warning of the fate awaiting the evil one and all who follow him. The Jewish leadership and the Roman governors thought they would judge Jesus. But look carefully at Jesus' words in verse 31. What he's saying here is that his suffering and death would be their judgment all those who are alienated from God. And then Jesus goes on to tell another effect of the cross. Look carefully at verse 31 again. He says, now is the ruler of the world cast out. Now, I'm going to ask you to be very precise with me. He's talking in verse 31 in this moment about the evil one. In what sense was Satan cast out at the death of Jesus? Most believers fall into one of two very opposite camps about what to do with the evil one. One hand, they think he either has, he has no power, he's even non-existent, and they poo-poo any mention of the evil one. For other believers, they think the evil one controls believers, possesses believers. They're, they're held in bondage by him and can do nothing. But what the New Testament teaches is a very balanced perspective. We know that the evil one remains active in the world because the New Testament tells how to battle against him. For example, in Ephesians 6, we are told what armor we are to wear against him and how to fight against him. And we know, as we will see in just a few weeks from John 13, 27, that we are told that Satan entered into bodily, he entered into Judas in the hour before Jesus' arrest. So the picture there is of Satan making a final move against Jesus, seeking to destroy the whole work of redemption. But he failed. And in failing, he was judged and decisively defeated. Jesus will say later in John 16 that the, that the Holy Spirit is coming to convict the world concerning judgment because the ruler of the world has been judged. And so look carefully at those words in verse 31. What Jesus is telling us is the evil one will be judged in the sense that he experiences defeat at the cross. Not the final defeat, 
but the one that secures and guarantees the final defeat. It's at the cross in the empty tomb that the head of the serpent is crushed, fulfilling the first and oldest promise of the gospel. I've had in the last month one of the neatest times. My wife didn't think it was neat at all. I don't know why. But it was one of the neatest uh, events that's happened in our 20 years living in Greenville. I've had not one, but two snakes show up at my house. And this has been, I've thought of calling all junior high boys to come over to my house because this is the neatest. And the first one happened as Sandy and I were sitting on our back patio drinking our coffee. And I said, don't move too fast, but there's a snake slithering down the tree right behind you. She moved fast. (laughs) And so she ran inside and stood at the screen door and watched. And I reached into our new barn and I got a hatchet. And I didn't, I was later rebuked by some of you men in the congregation. You said, Carl, you should have left that snake along because it kills rats. I know, I know all that stuff. But my wife in the moment was saying, kill him. (laughs) So I reached in the barn and got the hatchet and I waited for the snake to slither down the tree. And when he finally came down, I walked over and He was about this long when you stretched him out, and I chopped his head off. Every junior high boy here is saying, yes, I wish I could have been at your house that day. And you know what that snake did? He didn't die. His head was sitting here, and his body was sitting there, and he continued to slither for 20 minutes. Now, the better part happened A few days later, what unbeknownst to us, the snake family had moved in. There was a snake on the front side of my house. Knew what to do. Got the hatchet. Same thing. I think this was Mrs. Snake now. And so did the exact same thing. And now I was looking carefully at my watch. This snake continued to slither headless for a half an hour. Its head was laying over there. Its body was still doing this. This is a really tough group of of snakes. And so what you see in that is an exact picture of the evil one. He has been rendered powerless. He is a vanquished enemy. The Christ has crushed him. He was stripped of his dominion in the first advent of Jesus. But he is still, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, going to and fro He fights from death row. He's a conquered, defeated enemy, but he's still seeking to wreak havoc. That's what Jesus means here in verse 31 when he says, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. His head will be chopped off. Well, notice Jesus goes on. Look at verse 32 and 33. And what I hope that you will do is I hope that you'll stay with me because this is Christ-centered preaching. This is preaching Christ crucified. This is the highest species of preaching. Dive deep into verse 32 and 33 with me. Jesus speaks about what's going to happen to him on Good Friday. He says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. When Jesus said, if I am lifted up, what does this mean? Of what is Jesus speaking? The next verse, verse 33, answers the question he's speaking of when he says in verse 32, if I am lifted up, he's speaking of his manner of death on the cross. There were then in the first century three forms of execution used by the Romans. Death by burning, mauling by beasts, and crucifixion. All historians acknowledge that crucifixion was the worst due to its agonizing and torturous slowness. Crucifixion was a a method of execution adopted by the Romans to punish serious crimes. It was always done in public as a a warning, as a deterrence to other would-be criminals. It was almost never used on Roman citizens, but it was reserved for slaves, pirates, and political insurgents. And I should point out etymologically that we get our word excruciating from the word crucifixion. Let me remind you, when Jesus says these words, look at verse 32 when he says, If I am lifted up from the earth, he knew exactly what he was walking into. He knew what 
awaited. Here's what awaited him in just a few days. The cross was a pole placed in the ground, topped by a portable crossbeam. The victim was laid on the ground, attached to the crossbeam while on the ground, and the cross beam was connected to the center pole. There were a few historical cases of crucifixion without nails where the victim would just be lashed to the cross. But in the case of Jesus, we'll see in John 20, we know that nails were used. And that itself was miraculous in that nails were driven into his extremities without any bones being broken. But when men were nailed to the cross, the torture was beyond description from words because nails would be driven through the nerve centers of the wrists, the palms, the ankles. Nails at crucifixion sites had been recovered by archaeologists in the last 30 years, and they were usually anywhere from 7 to 9 inches long. Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m., remained on the cross until 3 p.m., and for the second half, from noon until 3 p.m., there was darkness completely over the land. And Jesus, in those, those six horrible hours, he spoke seven phrases. These words, we called them the seven last sayings of the cross. These words were particularly agonizing because Jesus would have to speak each during an exhalation. That's why the seven words are each so brief. And each breath would have been crushingly painful. And among the other agonies a crucified man would endure, his feet would rest on a tiny step not very far from the ground. And he would have severe inflammation. His ankles and lower extremities would swell. The swelling from the wounds in the, the area of the nails would begin from infection. Unbearable pain from torn tendons. Fearful discomfort from the strained position of the body. Intense headaches because of the infection and swelling beyond anything a migraine sufferer has ever known. An intense burning thirst, which is Jesus, why he cried out, I thirst. Every movement a cross bearer made was agonizing as it would involve severe pain to the hands, the feet, and the back which had been made raw by the scraping. Add to this all the pain which the midday sun beating down would pour down with no shade available. And then there were the indignities, the humiliations. Hordes of insects, birds of prey would come and do their worst and the the victim was powerless to stop them because his hands are, are tied. Death by crucifixion was an agonizingly slow process. There are documented accounts in the Roman annals of some men taking days to die. Sometimes in order to hasten death, the Roman soldiers would increase the strain on the body by breaking the leg bones of the victim. Without the ability to support their body, the victim's lungs would collapse, causing suffocation. The cause of death, if you were a coroner standing by, the cause of death for cross sufferers usually was a combination of several things. Exposure, asphyxia, and blood loss, or a severe cardiac rupture. But what I haven't mentioned yet is what troubled Jesus' soul so much. It was not what I just described. It was the cursedness of death on a cross. The Old Testament law decreed that having one's body hung on a tree was a mark, a demonstration of being accursed by God. And this, of course, was why the Jews wanted, wanted the Romans to hang Jesus on a cross so that it would demonstrate that he was cursed by God. The idea of a crucified Messiah was preposterous to them, not understanding that Jesus was becoming a curse for us. As a substitute for us, he bore our sin and its consequences, even the curse of a holy God. This is why Paul, quoting Deuteronomy 21, says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Here then, at the cross of Jesus, two fundamentally opposite conceptions collide. In one case, the offense of the cross, the idea that anything important, anything life-giving could come from such an execution. And in the other hand, the Christian proclamation that only through such a death on the part of the Son of God could men be made right with the Father. 
This antithesis with these two different conceptions of the cross are always resolved in the same way. It is only when a man realizes, I deserve that. What Jesus is suffering is what I deserve. It suddenly makes sense. It's only when a person comes to understand that he deserves that what Jesus suffered, that the appalling nature of Jesus' death becomes no longer an obstacle to faith, but it's a tremendously powerful attraction. So when Jesus, look at verse 32, when he spoke of being lifted up, he was completely aware of what he would encounter. He went to the cross with his eyes wide open. There were no surprises there for him. Jesus had been thinking about this. He'd referred at the beginning of his ministry, way back in John 3, when Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But then comes the strangest add-on to Christ being lifted up. Look at verse 32. Jesus said, if he's lifted up from the earth, He will draw all peoples to himself. So look carefully. Now we're coming to the real result of the cross. Look at verse 32. Jesus says, if he's lifted up, speaking of the death, he'll die. If he's crucified and then dead and buried and raised, he will draw men. If he can die a substitutionary death for the sins of a great multitude that no man can number, surely... Surely he can exert a powerful influence on the hearts of men, wooing them, pulling them to himself. Now look at that word in verse 32 where it says, Christ says he will draw all peoples to himself. The Greek word here used for draw means the putting forth of of great strength so as to drag or pull an inanimate and heavy object. It has reference even to the impelling of unwilling subjects. But notice, it's not just Jesus drawing men, no. Look carefully at verse 32. This is what's called in logic an if-then statement. If crucified, then will draw. It is, look carefully at verse 32. It is the crucified Jesus who will draw men. Christ without the cross can draw nobody. Men will not be drawn by the wonderful example of Jesus. They will only be drawn, stare at verse 32, they will only be drawn by the bleeding, dying, atoning, crucified Jesus. That's what Jesus teaches. And look who he will draw. Look at verse 32. Who will he draw? The context is in a discussion with Gentiles. You remember just above this in verse 20, you had Gentiles coming to see Jesus, and Jesus lets them hear this. He will draw all peoples to himself. He will be successful. Notice that he will do this. He will succeed. He will effectually draw people from every nation, tribe, tongue, race, and educational status. This has already been prophesied in the Old Testament in texts like Isaiah 2, where we are told that God will draw all nations to his house. That's why the the descriptions in Revelation 7 of the throne scenes are so vital. They show us when we're told that around the throne there will be people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. They show us that Christ has kept his word in verse 32, that he indeed has drawn men, all peoples, to himself from every possible ethnicity. And notice where men will be drawn. Look a little longer at verse 32. Where will men be drawn? To myself. Jesus is saying that he will be the sole object of men's faith and trust. So he must be seen, understood, and grasped if he is to be their savior. That's why his invitation is always, come to me. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let me apply this text to you. First of all, let me ask you a question, a very simple one. Why does the cross attract men? Why does a a crucified Savior attract men? Because it solves your deepest problem. How wicked sinners can be made right with their creator and judge. 
It is only as our sins are laid on a righteous substitute and that substitute die, paying the penalty for you and I, that we can have peace with God. The cross attracts men because it clearly shows forth the Savior. Another reason why the cross attracts men is because it expresses the amazing love of God for sinners. In 1 John 3, we hear these words, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Or again in 1 John 4, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If it had not been for the cross, we would have never had a clue about the extent and depth of God's love for us. The reason why the cross attracts men is they get it, they understand this is the symbol of the love of God, that God loves sinners this much that he would send his beloved and only son to die for them. But I would tell you, look at what Jesus says in verse 32. Men will not come to Christ unless he draws them. Because of the hardness of their heart, because of the willful blindness of mankind given to suppressing truth and unrighteousness, because of the love of darkness and the hatred of the light, men will not come unless they are pulled, unless they are effectually called. My friend, if you have come to Christ, it means this. It means he had to draw you. He had to turn you around and pull you to himself because you were not looking to him. Didn't Jesus already teach about you and I these words in John 6? No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. My friend, do you realize this today? That if you're in Christ today, it's because God patiently, lovingly persevered to pull you to himself. You're in Christ today because he worked on your heart and mind and drew you, effectually called you. But there's one other thing about the cross that you should notice. The cross is intended to do something to you and I. It's intended to humble us. Jesus chose to be crucified with two thieves, one on either side, with the lowest of sinners, to show us just what kind of people he's dying for. The cross is intended to humble your pride and mine. For we never think of, want to think of ourselves as being like these two vile men. We want to think that we are fundamentally decent people. And we're glad that Jesus died for really bad people, but we just aren't that bad. My friend, as we go through these next few days in the life of Christ, let me remind you, remind you the reason why Jesus must be lifted up is the cross and the men dying there are a true estimation of your sins and mine. Christ died for sinners. Let's pray together. Our Father, enable us to study and understand the cross rightly and see Jesus there atoning, drawing sinners to himself. And let us see the Father in answer to the Son's prayer, receiving glory. O oh Lord, never let us outgrow the cross, but let us instead know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the word by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnal and turning to Psalm 91a and sing stanzas 1 through 5. Psalm 91a. <laughs>
Now receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.